presidential nominee George McGovern, speaking about his daughter Terry, whose death in 1994 was caused by alcohol. He speaks at the Library Limited Bookstore in St. Louis, Missouri. The senator is introduced by his 1972 running mate, former Senator Thomas Eagleton. I feel like I'm giving a press conference here. I've never had this main microphone. <laughs> On behalf of the Library Limited, I welcome you to um, a very, very special afternoon. These two uh, uh, haven't seen each other since 1972. Here to introduce our special guest, Senator Tom Eagleton. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I was a bit late. I hope it didn't inconvenience you too much. Before I specifically introduce George for the purpose of him discussing his marvelous book about his daughter, Terry, I'd like to say a background historical note or two, since in this marvelous bookstore are so many books, not all, but so many that pertain to history. George McGovern went to the Senate in 1962. At that time, the Vietnam War was in its, uh, I guess we could say, embryonic stage. Our participation was slight. It didn't appear that it could really amount to all that much. Uh, but George and a few others, including our great mutual friend Gaylord Nelson and uh, very few others, saw very early on that that war had ominous implications insofar as the United States was concerned, being the wrong war in the wrong place at the wrong time for a massive American commitment. I came to the Senate 16, or six, <laughs> seems like an eon ago, six years later, 1968, by which time the war was at its uh, full tempo. Lyndon Johnson had left office because of the war. Uh, Richard Nixon had been elected to office pledging that he had a secret plan to end the war. Uh, he didn't have the secret plan and it was not ended. And in the final result, it took 50, about 58,000 American lives, 300, 350,000 severely wounded billions and billions of our national treasure. And it was that common interest, George very early on, mine six years delayed in trying to somehow bring this nightmare to a halt that uh, began our friendship in the United States Senate. I think during my tenure there, we overlapped 12 years roughly. I think during my tenure there, if I had to list my top 10, uh, George would most definitely be very high up on that, that very uh, awesome list, along with people like Mansfield and Cooper, my colleague Stuart Symington, Phil Hart, uh, who I think was one of the greatest of the great, etc. And he put more of his energy and more of his talents in trying to bring that war to a conclusion uh, than when he, any one other member of the Senate and for that, history will judge him to be preeminently right when so many, many others were tragically wrong. He's gone on to do other things, as have I, and he's most recently written this wonderful book about his daughter. I knew her slightly. I, I won't pretend that I knew her uh, terribly well, but I, I knew her slightly, as did my wife, Barbara. I don't know how many of you have read this book yet or glanced through it. I would like, if I have the liberty of doing so, reading part of one page, because I think it served to me or showed to me the scope of the problem that this country faces, not only in the lives of, say, the McGovern family and the one individual that is focused upon in this book, but the, the nation as a whole insofar as what Terry McGovern's problem portends for that whole nation. George writes on page 186, 
More people are in hospitals of America because of alcoholism than because of any other factor. More highway accidents, including thousands of deaths and crippling injuries, are caused by alcoholism than any other factor. More unwanted pregnancies and instances of child's abuse and spousal abuse are caused by alcoholism than any one other factor. More crime results from alcoholism than any other factor. More job and productivity losses stem from alcoholism than from any other factor. The economic and social costs of alcohol are staggering beyond belief. It represents our costliest un budget. The dollar cost alone is estimated to be over $100 billion yearly. These stark facts are ignored, George goes on to write. They're ignored, they're denied, are defied by America's 20 million, 20 million alcoholics, except for the one and a half million who are now in recovery. But what is even more alarming is that most of the rest of us ignore, deny, and defy these hard facts. George McGovern has not seen fit to ignore, deny, or defy these hard facts. And that's why he's written this very personal and very moving book about his daughter, Terry McGovern, who spent most of her life as an alcoholic, struggling, as George puts it, to say farewell to her old but treacherous friend, alcohol. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to present to you George McGovern, the author of this very fine book. Let me uh, say, first of all, that I'm delighted to be in St. Louis uh, today. My experience with this city goes back to uh, World War II when I came here as a young member of the uh, Army Air Corps and spent a month at Jefferson Barracks. I won't pretend that that was the most pleasant month of my life, but I do recall coming into this city one night stopping near the St. Louis uh, Opera House and having an usher come out and invite me to sit on the stage behind the great soprano, uh, Marian Anderson, who did a concert that night, and she had six GIs sitting behind her in a semicircle. I could reach out and touch her at any time during that evening. I'll never forget that experience. I'm an old uh, St. Louis Cardinal fan, and uh, I... Uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Tom Eagleton, took me to see them play last night for the first time in my life. I've been supporting them out in South Dakota since I was 10 years uh, of age. So that's another fond association I have with uh, St. Louis. Uh, I'm glad to be in this great bookstore today. I think Library Limited in St. Louis is one of the great independent bookstores, not only in this country, uh, in the world. And so I'm pleased that they're accommodating us today. But most of all, I'm pleased that I was introduced so generously by uh, Tom Eagleton. Uh, that means a lot to me. We, uh, we almost were a team uh, in 1972, and I'm not going to pretend I haven't had a lot of days when I wish we had gone forward. I think uh, McGovern and Eagleton would have been a terrific team. Uh, whether, uh, <clears throat> uh, whether, uh, whether that might have changed the uh, outcome of the election, uh, no one can say. I suspect, looking back on it, that perhaps uh, no one could have defeated Richard Nixon in 1972. He was at the height of his political power. And he used the power of the White House very adroitly and very uh, cleverly 
So it probably wasn't in the cards uh, for anyone to defeat him in 1972, particularly after Governor Wallace was shot and was unable to run as an independent candidate. He was a very powerful third force in American politics in 72, more powerful, for example, than Ross Perot was in 1992. And I have no doubt that except for that tragic accident, he would have run as a third candidate and probably would have taken much of the South and many votes in the North away from President Nixon. It's possible under those conditions we might have won. Without that, when you add the Wallace vote to the Nixon vote, it was probably insurmountable in uh, 72. In any event, I want to reciprocate the kind words that Tom said about me, putting me on that uh, list of 10. I'm already on record in this city as putting him in the top six of the uh, <laughs> uh, senators. And so uh, we, uh, I, I've had a wonderful time with Tom and Barbara. Uh, it made coming to St. Louis uh, worthwhile, even if I didn't have an opportunity to talk about my uh, book. I'm very impressed that he brought the Los Angeles Rams uh, to St. Louis, and I say that as a fanatical Washington Redskin uh, <laughs> supporter. I'm going to be supporting the Rams in every game except when they play the Washington Redskins. But in any event, uh, thanks so much, Tom, for coming out and participating so generously today. What I would like to do in the uh, time that remains is to just spend uh, three or four minutes uh, reading a few of the opening paragraphs of my book just so you can get the flavor of it and so our television audience can get the flavor of it. And uh, then I'd like to talk about it. I'm, I'm more of a talker than I am a reader, especially when it comes to this uh, book that means so much to me. And perhaps we can save a few minutes for questions from those of you who are uh, here in the audience. Um, Terry was what everyone called her. When she was born, we named her uh, Teresa Jane McGovern. She came to prefer being called by her proper name, uh, Teresa. But somehow, uh, almost from the beginning, Terry seemed the perfect name for this engaging, fun-loving, uh, pretty little girl. I had a special name for her, uh, the bear. Over the years of uh, putting an arm around her shoulder, I would proclaim the old bear, or tear the bear. How this uh, affectionate term originated, I've forgotten, but perhaps it was because as a toddler, she reminded me of a playful bear cub. Early on, she developed a habit of pulling a tiny piece of fuzz from a teddy bear or a doll or a shaggy blanket and rolling it between her fingers or gently across her upper lip. This was the way she always went to sleep as a child and it continued to the end. June 10th, 1949 was a sweltering hot day in Mitchell, South Dakota as my wife Elner gave birth to Teresa Jane, our third daughter. Eleanor. Uh, recalls that delivery as the easiest of our five children, but I still uh, remember fashioning a fan from a newspaper in the stifling uh, maternity ward and trying to cool the perspiring uh, young mother. Forty-five years later, on December 12, 1944, Madison, Wisconsin was covered with seven inches of snow and the temperature was far below freezing. Teresa left a Madison bar that night, stumbled into the snow, and froze to death. She had fallen before from excessive drinking in every season of the year, but this time there was simply uh, too much snow, too much cold for a fragile body to overcome. How could this have happened? My uh, lovable little girl who had given me <laughs> 10,000 laughs, 
uh, countless moments of affection and joy, and yes, years of anxiety and disappointment, now frozen to death like some deserted outcast. Terry uh, had a multitude of friends who admired and loved her everywhere she had ever lived or gone to school, worked or played. Every one of them talk about her kindness, her warmth, her intelligence, her compassion, her marvelous wit. Why then did she drink so much and die so young? The blunt answer is that Teresa Jane McGovern was an alcoholic, one of 20 million alcoholics in the United States. She died as over 100,000 other American alcoholics do every year. The difference was that Terry was the daughter of a prominent family. She had campaigned across the country for me in 72. The moment her body was identified, her death was news uh, around the world. I was open about Terry's death, not only because it was virtually impossible to be silent about it, but because I wanted both her life and her death to be understood and appreciated, and I wanted others to gain from the lessons her life can teach us. I write this book for the same reason. I want my fellow citizens, and especially my fellow parents, to know that alcoholism is a deadly disease that can strike any family, rich or poor, wise or foolish, strong or weak, young or old. Alcoholism is like a thief in the night that can steal up on you and seize your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness before you comprehend what happened. Well, let me uh, just elaborate for a few minutes on these uh, themes. Um, we learned about Terry's death on the 13th of December. She uh, had been released the morning before, December 12th, about 9 o'clock in the morning, from a detoxification center in Madison, uh, Wisconsin. They didn't want her to leave, but they had no uh, legal authority to hold her against her uh, will. She spent a happy day with uh, some of her friends. She uh, rented yet another apartment, which I helped her with financially and was determined to start life uh, anew. About five o'clock, she said goodbye to the elderly landlord and uh, told him she had to pick up a few items for her apartment. Uh, but unfortunately, she stopped at a familiar old haunt of hers, the Crystal Corner Bar on Williamson Street in Madison, just a few blocks from the University of Wisconsin that she loved so much. And a Vietnam veteran uh, bought her a vodka on the rocks. Somebody else bought another round. It was the Christmas season. There were a few toasts to Merry Christmas. In any event, uh, along about 8.30, some three and a half hours later, they wouldn't serve her any longer. This was supposed to be just one drink. She um, walked about 50 yards into a bitterly cold, dark night with seven or eight inches of snow on the ground. She made it to a narrow alleyway and stumbled into this little alley and either lay down or fell in the snow behind a small a printing shop. It turned out that the owner was a, an old supporter of mine who had organized Wisconsin for us in uh, 1972. Uh, the next day, about noontime, 16 hours after Terry apparently had uh, fallen in the snow, he opened the back door of his print shop to uh, see if there was a place for him to park his car and he saw this small body lying there. It was, of course, Terry. Uh, he, um, he at first thought it was a, a 13 or 14-year-old child. She was a small uh, woman. 
but when he got outside, he, uh, he realized uh, that it was a, an older uh, woman. Terry was 45, looked like she was about 30. Um, in any event, there was no identification on her body. She had five $1 bills and a key to this new apartment, and that was it. So it was near nightfall before the police uh, could identify uh, who she was. Elner and I had been out to dinner that night in uh, Washington. When we came in, uh, Elner went upstairs and, and went to bed, started to read a novel. I stayed downstairs for a while to play the piano, uh, not well, but uh, enthusiastically. And uh, shortly thereafter, the front doorbell rang and here was a policeman and a priest to uh, tell us what had happened, that our daughter had been found dead in a snowbank in uh, Wisconsin earlier that day, apparently uh, intoxicated and had, uh, had frozen to death. I've had a lot of occasion to think about this and other aspects of Terry's life. Uh, with the passage of the first few weeks, I was just unable to accept the fact that this wonderful young life was just going to terminate out in a snowbank in Wisconsin. And I began to think about what I could do to translate this tragedy into something uh, positive. I think if I have any one strength that might be commendable. It's the fact that in the course of my life I've tried to turn tragedy and disappointment and setbacks into something uh, affirmative and constructive. Uh, and I know that's been a characteristic of uh, Senator Eagleton. So we uh, uh, began to talk about what could be done and I had the idea of writing this book. Elner was very much opposed to it. She said, George, this is a private matter. This is a deeply personal matter. You have no right to dig into Terry's diaries and her journals and spread this story on the public record for the critics to tear apart and for people to uh, uh, discuss. There are lots of things in there that should not be in the public domain. I went ahead with the book somewhat nervously, despite Elner's opposition, is one of the few times in my life that I have done that. We've been married for 52 years. You don't survive that long by ignoring <laughs> the uh, wishes of your spouse. But when she saw the manuscript, Elner turned around 180 degrees and she said, you've got to publish this. You've got to go forward with this. So with the cooperation of Random House, one of the great publishers in the country, their Ballard uh, division, with David Rosenthal as the head, we decided to push for a publication. And I'm very glad that I have, because this book has accomplished two things. First of all, it's been a kind of a love letter on my part to Terry. And uh, it has enabled me to say some of the things I wish I had said uh, when she was alive. It's enabled me to tell other people about the positive, uh, admirable uh, qualities of this person. Uh, I don't know of anyone with a greater sense of compassion than Terry had. The day she died, she was going over to the courthouse to renew her driver's license. And she saw an old man trying to get across an icy, snow-filled street. He was having great difficulty. She insisted that the driver stop the car. She got out, took him by the arm, helped him across the uh, street uh, and into the courthouse. That was so typical of Terry. I could tell you hundreds of stories like that that have come to me from people even since she died that knew her. Uh, she was a person of great courage. Um, she was a person of uh, considerable tenacity. She didn't want to be an alcoholic. She put herself into treatment programs repeatedly. She went into the AA program. She talked to counselors and psychiatrists, the old hands in the, the alcohol field. She read the Bible looking for some insight there. She read the Eastern religious literature, all those things, everything you could think of uh, she did, and I wanted people to know that part of her 
uh, struggle. I think at some level, Terry never could quite let go 100% of her old friend Booz. I want to say to those of you who listen to this story and say, well, what the Dickens is the use then of even trying if Terry McGovern couldn't make it after all these treatments and AA efforts, uh, how can I expect to make it? I think the best chance you have of making it is doing what Terry probably failed to do in the end, which is to stay with that Alcoholics Anonymous program, that great 12-step program, the consistent attendance at meetings, staying in touch with her sponsor, some of those things she didn't do uh, in the long term as consistently as she should have. But beyond that, I, uh, I wrote this book because I wanted people to understand some of the lessons that we have learned as a family. One thing I've learned is that you must somehow be able to draw a distinction between this disease that you hate, and make no mistake about it, alcoholism is a disease, and the victim of that disease. I remember one time having dinner with Terry, a nice little restaurant out in Madison. She'd been sober for several weeks, and we had a wonderful time that night, lots of humor and lots of laughter, which always was a characteristic of Terry. And I finally said to her near the end of the evening, you know, Terry, uh, you have these two wonderful little daughters. You've done a good job in spite of the alcoholism with uh, teaching them the, the basic values about life. And I don't know a more lovable person on this earth than you uh, when you're not drinking. And she said with uh, a kind of a sad smile, if a smile can be sad, well, Dad, thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. But do you think it's possible I'm a little bit lovable even when I'm drinking? I think at some point in her mind, she always knew that danger was there. And she couldn't quite take the implication of what I was saying, that she was lovable when she wasn't drinking. But she interpreted that to mean that uh, I couldn't stand her when she was. We, we can't have that attitude towards people. That doesn't mean we have to lay down and be a doormat to uh, members of our family or others who are exploiting us. We don't have to just shovel out the money indefinitely and find it being used to keep them drinking. We don't have to lie about them to their employers. But what we do have to do is always remember to let them know we, we love them. Um, call them up from time to time and just say, I want you to know I love you. I don't like the drinking, but I love you. I think that's important. Alcoholics are desperate for that kind of uh, emotional uh, support. So I pass that on to you for, for whatever it's worth. Just one line here, and then I'm going to open this up for questions. My father, an old-fashioned Methodist clergyman, uh, had a line that everybody in this room has heard from somebody, uh, hate the sin, but love the sinner. And I would just uh, modify that to say, hate the alcoholism. It's the number one health problem in this country, in my opinion, does more damage to our society than any other single ailment uh, that I can think of, but love the alcoholic and do what you can to, to either get them into the AA program or into treatment and stay with them even when they fail and do what you can to let them know there's at least one person somewhere that loves them and is uh, concerned uh, about them. My. Uh, daughter, just about everybody I see now knows about. We know about Terry McGovern. But every day, 300 other Americans, just as precious as Terry, die from alcoholism. We don't hear about them. Many of them have been out of touch with their families for years. Problems have developed. They've lost their spouses. They've lost their families. They've drifted away. And when they die, there might be a little item in the local press that the police have found an unidentified body in a cheap rooming house or in an alley or in a snowbank, but it doesn't make much of a ripple. Now, in this case, um, everybody uh, knows about it, and I want this book uh, not simply because of my pride as an author, which is minimal, but 
I want this book to be widely circulated. It's as good a job as I can do telling the story of Terry's life and death. It tells you everything that I have learned about this major problem in our society. And I would like to think that in God's good time, uh, Terry's death and her struggle uh, will come to be a redemptive force in our society. Thank you so much for coming out to uh, <laughs> Maybe we can take just a few minutes now for questions and then I'll be happy to sign books for as long as there are people here wanting me to, to do that. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to, as you mentioned, probably the number one problem in America being alcoholism because it does affect so many uh, areas of our society. Why is it that the U.S. government doesn't recognize that uh, and spend more money to educate the public because I think the public in general unless they know of someone who is an alcoholic mm -hmm. and can see firsthand the damage that it does mm -hmm. uh, they think the normal alcoholic is a skid row bum yeah they think that it's a matter more streamlined well I think the answer to that uh, goes uh, not only to the government but to our whole society for example most medical schools do not train doctors to deal with alcoholism. I, I say this uh, respectfully of the medical profession, but I think it's a fact that most doctors know very little about alcoholism. Uh, that's not basically the government's responsibility. It's the responsibility of both private and public uh, medical schools uh, across the country, and maybe that's where we begin with a greater knowledge of this. I do think it's regrettable that the government has not been as generous with research funds on alcoholism as it should have been. That's one of the reasons we've started this little McGovern Family Foundation to try to stimulate more contributions from individuals that can be earmarked for research on alcoholism. We've done a good job on cancer in this country. If you discover tomorrow morning that you have cancer, the chances are about one in two that you can recover if you seek treatment. That's a remarkable record compared to where we were 25 or 50 years ago. But with alcoholism, if you discover that, you've in the, that you're addicted, uh, the chances are probably not better than one in five that you will recover. We don't know an awful lot about alcoholism in the United States yet. We don't know how to prevent it. We, uh, and that's total abstinence, which is awfully hard to sell. Uh, I haven't sold that to myself. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't know uh, uh, much about how to identify people who are vulnerable to alcoholism. I happen to believe that it runs in families. My grandfather McGovern was an alcoholic, so was my only brother. His son died of alcoholism. My son suffers from alcoholism, although he's in a successful recovery uh, program. So it tends to run in, uh, in families. Uh, I've noticed in the McGovern clan, whether you're talking about the ones in Ireland where they originated or the ones over here, uh, it's risky to be, uh, to be drinking very much. Now that doesn't mean if you're born in a family like that you're automatically condemned to be an alcoholic. It does mean that the risks are greater and you have to uh, watch it uh, carefully. We need to know more about why people chronically relapse. It's comparatively easy to get somebody into treatment or into the AA program. What is hard is to achieve 10 years of sobriety or 20 years or a lifetime. So we need to know more about the relapse factor. We need to know why alcoholism hits women harder than it does men. Why do they suffer more loss of self-esteem, self-loathing, uh, demoralization, breakdown under the impact of uh, alcoholism? Uh, so um, I, I agree with the thrust of your question that both the government and the private sector and the medical schools need to do a lot more on, particularly on the side of research and treatment than we, we now do. I regret that Congress has recently cut back on funding on alcoholism. 
Senator McGovern, also, uh, you mentioned that she suffered from depression. And um, I guess as I was looking at the beginning of the book, I wondered if you don't see the depression as feeding into the relapse. And the same is true of depression is that funds have been cut too. Can you give some insight into that? Well, I think that uh, this is another area of uncertainty. Uh, we need to confront honestly that we have more questions about both alcoholism and depression than we have answers. It's my own view, and this is a tentative view, that the uh, depression did not cause the alcoholism. But as your question implies, I think it helps feed the relapse factor. Uh, if life is not particularly happy for you when you're in sobriety, there's a greater temptation to start drinking again. What the heck? I'll get a little relief from this with a few bombs today, a few drinks. And uh, so that does, I think, feed the relapse. I think that unresolved conflicts, emotional conflicts, tend to feed the relapse problem. They may not cause the initial alcoholism. More likely, that's a result of genetic or hereditary of vulnerability to uh, alcohol. But I do think these emotional and, and depression problems can contribute to the relapse problem. Terry was afflicted with serious depression. That's sometimes more serious with women alcoholics because for reasons I think you can understand, women are more embarrassed about becoming uh, alcoholics. We have in our society a a view of a male standing at the end of the bar and quaffing a few drinks and maybe staggering a little, sort of the Marlboro type figure walking out of the bar and sauntering down the street. But when a woman does that, they themselves, because of the values in our society, feel more of a loss of self-esteem and self-confidence. Terry eventually got to the point where she thought she was kind of a worthless drunk. Uh, and that was one of the things that kept her drinking. You know, I've got to get out of this misery, so maybe at least one more drink, or I'll just get fortified with a couple today, and then I can get through this misery. And I think those things go hand in hand. Yeah, over here. I'd like to thank you, Senator McGovern, for writing your book, because I'm sure all of us here would not be here if the horrible disease of alcoholism hasn't affected our lives. Yeah. And it is reassuring to know that, yes, someone does understand and someone cares. Thank you. I also wanted to ask you if you knew if anything or how this happened just uh, several months ago in Washington, that Congress did pass a bill which uh, will eliminate any social security disability from anyone who is receiving it that has the word alcoholism among other things. And uh, yet there are other social diseases that were not eliminated. And I was just curious as to what was the reasoning behind this? Well, the reasoning behind that is not very good reasoning. It's a rejection of the concept of alcoholism as a disease. Forty years ago, the American Medical Association, that is not always noted for its uh, fearlessness, uh, declared that uh, alcoholism was a disease. And that's been the official position of the American Medical Association ever since the 1950s. It is a disease. There's no question about that. The initial decision to drink may be a matter of choice, but once that addiction seizes you by the throat and you become an alcohol addict, which is what an alcoholic is, you've got a problem, you've got a disease, and you've got to have professional help or the support of some group or the AA program to get over it. So I think Congress makes a mistake when it eliminates alcoholics as people who need medical care. They do need medical care, and if they don't get it, they're going to be a lot more costly to society than if we help them uh, into recovery. Yes, it should start with Congress, it, uh, and, and we ought to work on our own kids on this problem, too. I'm going to take one more question, and then let's, open, let's begin signing books, which is one of the reasons I'm here. You've done very well politically with college students yes. in your life. Now, I'm thinking, are you taking this message to campuses now? Absolutely. I, I've had a special love affair with college students and faculty members all of my life. I used to be a college prof. I have a a doctor's degree in history from Northwestern University and used to be a teacher, so I've stayed in close touch 
with college students all these years. That's how I've made my living since I left the Senate. I'm out on the lecture circuit a great, a great deal. But what I find is a disturbing problem on campuses, and it doesn't make any difference about the quality of the campus, uh, whether it's Harvard or whether it's uh, uh, Podunk College. Um, what I've discovered is that uh, these beer bus on the weekend, uh, the uh, six pack has been replaced with a keg and uh, there's a regular pattern of heavy drinking that goes on on all too many campuses with all too many students. Now young people think they're immortal. They think that they can, uh, that they can drink a keg. Uh, that they can uh, Friday night, Saturday night after Saturday night get blasted and that nothing will ever happen. They'll get up in the morning and they'll feel fine and that may be true for a while. It may be true all through college, but if that pattern continues when they're 25, 35, 45, they're going to wake up one day and realize that the drinking is out of control, that they're on the verge of losing their health or their spouses or their jobs, or they'll smash their car, and they're in serious trouble. So I warn college and high school students uh, uh, to be careful about this. You know, it's against the law in every state in the union to drink until you're 21 years of age. We ought to enforce that law. And we, the universities ought to work on it. The families ought to work on it. If we can do that, uh, we can reduce greatly the amount of alcoholism in this country. I don't mean to imply by that that you couldn't become an alcoholic after you're 21, but if you can keep youngsters from drinking when they're in their teens until they hit that 21st uh, birthday, I guarantee you we will see a dramatic reduction in alcoholism in the United States, in automobile accidents, in rapes, in uh, child and spousal abuse, in crime, in uh, declining academic standards, declining athletic performance, all kinds of bad things that happen to people when they drink excessively, and especially if they do it at, at a youthful age. After they're 21, that's their, their adults, then they can make a decision, but, but that's the law of the land, and nobody needs to apologize for uh, enforcing the, the law. No drinking until you're 21 years of age, no drinking beer, wine, Vodka, bourbon, scotch, anything that has alcohol in it. A lot of people say, well, it's just a few beers. It's just a couple of bottles of wine. That's just as deadly as scotch or vodka or bourbon if you drink enough of it, which beer drinkers do, uh, and so do, the, uh, so do the wine drinkers. So we have to get that message out on university campuses. Let me again thank you for coming today, and I'll stay around. Where am I supposed to go as over here? In a minute, a discussion on the public's interest in spiritual books at a recent meeting of the Christian Booksellers Association. After that, a party for the publication of former Kennedy speechwriter Ted Sorensen's latest book, Why I Am a Democrat. And later, Jefferson scholar Andrew Burstein speaks about his book on the third president, The Inner Jefferson, Portrait of a Grieving Optimist. Here's a look at two bestseller 